Welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast, a podcast featuring interviews with equestrian authors who love all things horses and writing about them. In each episode, you'll hear inspirational stories from horse book authors, including writing advice and marketing tips to help you write your very own horse book. If you're an author, aspire to be an author, or simply love horse books, then you are in the right place. I'm your host, Carly Cade and creative writing makes my spurs jingle. Hi everyone, welcome to the Equestrian Author Spotlight. I am so excited to have Shelly Paulson on the show today. Hi Shelly, thanks for joining us. Hi Carly, I'm so glad to be here. I am so glad to have you. This is one of my very first podcast interviews, and I'm so honored to have you on the show. So with that, I'll do a little intro and read the folks your bio so they can get to know a little bit more about you. Sounds good. Shelly Paulson, yeah, awesome. Shelly Paulson <laughs> is an award-winning equestrian photographer based in Minnesota. She has combined her deep love of horses with her passion for creating heartfelt, meaningful images to create a thriving full-time career. Her work has been published worldwide and can be seen in various equine publications and advertising for major equine brands such as Horse Illustrated, Western Horseman, Neutrina, and Farnham. So that's amazing, Shelley. Why don't you tell us a little bit about you and, and how you got into equine photography? Well, we'd have to start with when I got into horses, you know, when I came out of the womb and really insisted on a pony. Um, I mean, you know how it is, like you're born just like loving horses. So, um, but to be honest, I went to school for music. I was going to be an opera singer and ended up just taking a couple of different turns in my career after that and ended up doing graphic and web design. And uh, that kind of was it about the start of digital photography? So I picked up a camera to be able to help my clients have better photos for their websites. And once you have a camera, then everybody wants you to take their pictures. So I became the photographer who shoots everything, like babies and families and maternity and weddings and horses, and but mostly not horses, because back then people just didn't have that many photos of horses, which is kind of unbelievable to think of now. But um, so mostly it was mostly horse show um, f photos at the time. And so um, I ended up kind of really sticking with web design and then wedding photography and spent a lot of years as a wedding photographer while building my equine photography business and kind of doing them side by side. And then eventually I had some uh, health issues and I needed to quit weddings because they're pretty grueling. And I just took the leap to become an, a full time equine photographer. And the first year was super hard and uh was very lean year but we made it through that and by focusing pr just primarily on horses i've been able to build a business that's just equine photography and when i go places and people say what do you do for a living i say i'm a horse photographer they kind of look at me like I i've never heard that before <laughs> so it's a really unique uh career but it's i mean i kind of feel like i have the best job in the whole wide world you certainly do. I am a huge fan of your photography. And, you know, honestly, when I, when I've been, when I did some research on you for this, this episode, I, I was like so excited to have you on the show because I've been a fan for a very long time. And what is really exciting is that you are considered now one of the, the top equestrian photographers in the country. How does that make you feel to have, have that sort of uh, reputation? I mean, it's, I mean, it feels great. It's a little like, I'm not a toot your own horn kind of person, um, but I do know that I have extraordinary opportunities because of the many years of hard work that I've put into my career. Um, I know that I just, my brain works really well for this and my heart works really into my work, but you know, 90% of it is just, you know, really working on my business and being smart about marketing and taking really good care of my clients so that I can stay in business and keep doing what I love. And so it is, it is really an honor to be recognized nationally um, and to have my work in, you know, magazines like Horse Illustrated and Western Horseman. But I try not to think about it too much because I still put on one, my pants one leg at a time and I go clean horse stalls every morning and, you know, like, I just, I'm just me. Well, you are fantastic and, and completely humble and your, your work speaks for itself. It is beautiful. So horses. So you, t you went from 
doing you know different photography and dabbling in different things and um you you photog you were a photographer at weddings for a long time and found that work to be grueling so you moved over to only horses which is i love i think anybody that loves horses would would think that that was a fabulous job but when it comes to horses like what really excites you about doing being the photographer for horses and their people they're humans you know what what excites you about your work well, when it comes to portraits, I really love just capturing the bond and and helping people preserve the memory of the relationship they have with their horses. I mean, you know that our relationships with our horses are complex and they're beautiful and sometimes they're full of conflict. And I mean, they're just as, I think, complicated as a lot of our human relationships are. And so to be able to capture that for people, and especially because we're going to outlive our horses, uh, hopefully you know, most of us, and so that when the horse is gone that people have that ability to remember the good times so i had a friend lose her horse um this year really unexpectedly we i did a session for her because her other horse is in his 20s or in her 20s and uh then she lost the younger dressage horse that she'd been showing and she was so devastated but you know the photos of that just beautiful relationship they had she has told me more than once how that has really helped in her healing process. And um, even just today, she ordered a big metal print to put on her wall to remember that horse by. So yeah, so it's being able to be a part of stories like that. I really love end of life sessions or senior horse sessions where, you know, the days are numbered. I have a, I have a 27 year old horse. And so I made sure to have somebody come out and do a session with me and my horses this year, you know, put my money where my mouth is. And, uh, you know, so that on the portrait side is really important. Uh, as a commercial and editorial photographer, it's a really different kind of photography. It's about serving a client and their needs. Um, sometimes it's photographing a product or a person using a product. And, you know, while it's maybe not all mushy gushy like the portrait photography, it's important. It helps. You know, it's a health product, a feed product, you know, these are things that better our horses' lives. So I can still find meaning in them. Um, and then, you know, just, I love doing just like personal projects too, where I go shoot a cattle drive, or I just was out in Maryland and shot Chincoteague ponies. And, you know, so one of the things I love best about equine photography is that within this genre, there's so much variety. And, you know, I'll just never run out of, um, you know, interesting things to photograph in different horses in different places. That's fantastic. You know, it's uh, it's really funny that you mentioned the end of life sessions because my husband, my horse hubby, actually in interviewed me for the podcast for the first episode to help people get to know me a little bit better, and then uh, asked some questions about the content of the podcast. and And he surprised me by asking me a few. Um, you know, uh, whirlwind questions that I was not expecting. And one of them was what, what is my biggest fear? And I actually, it actually brought tears to my eyes because I was like, you know, so she's getting older. Um, what, you know, that, that's my biggest fear. Like, how do I say goodbye? And I'm so fortunate that Shelly was actually here in Phoenix, uh, not too long ago and did a portrait session with myself and Sissy. So I have these beautiful, beautiful photos that I'll forever be able to remember her by that really captured these really touching moments between us. And uh, I want to thank you for that, Shelley. That was a, that was a real gift. Um, so I know, you know, we'll get into the, the visit here to Arizona in a little bit, but you, you've already mentioned portraits and you've mentioned commercial photography and you've mentioned, you know, adventures that you take on your own uh, to photograph horses. What other kind of services do you offer that might be exciting for people interested in having their horse photograph know about? Well, I have a YouTube channel. Um, I started that uh, two or three years ago when I thought I would do it like every week. <laughs> I did for a while and uh, it started out being just kind of like, you know, like uh, reviewing horse products and things. And then after about a year, I realized that I didn't have time to do that many videos and that the ones that really got the most views were the ones on photography. So I focused in my channel on just photography and um, it's been steadily growing. I'd say I probably post a video once every couple months. Um, I have a whole lot of things filmed that I could make videos of. So I'm kind of hoping to get a workflow going when the leaves fall off the trees here in Minnesota, which is only in like three weeks now. And 
and just really beef up that channel. In addition, I also have, um, we'll, I know we'll talk about this later, but I have an ebook on that's really geared towards people who don't take photos of horses that want to take better photos of horses. And so it's the quick start guide to equestrian photography. Um, and I, I used to do some mentoring. I had to take a break for a while just uh, because of my schedule. I just literally have too much work at this point. Um, but you know, if people kind of follow me on social media, they'll know when I when and if I ever open that up again or have other educational resources for people. That's wonderful. And uh, Shelly is a jack of all trades. You are you do so many wonderful things for for your community and and people that are interested in your work. Uh, and you also do an annual calendar, isn't that right? You've got oh, one, oh, one coming yeah. soon. Tell us a little yes. bit about the calendars. Well, I do a yearly calendar with generally photos from that year. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see if I get any fall pictures this year. Um, but I like to um, just, you know, make a calendar of beautiful photos of horses. If there's people in them, it's usually like a silhouette or something, you know. I don't really think people want to see other people's faces in a calendar as much, but um, my, you know, some of these personal trips I've been on lately, I've had just the opportunity to make some pretty, I would say even amazing photos, like stuff where I can't believe I got to take a photo of that. And so those will be in there. And, you know, it's a mix of, you know, naked horses running around and Western lifestyle and, and maybe some show jumping. I don't know. I haven't quite, that's the roadblock right now for getting it completed is I have a huge folder of candidates and uh they'll be it'll be put into a calendar pretty soon because i know people start to buy their calendars in late october early november so and they make great mind. gifts <laughs> i know they make wonderful they make gifts for gift. horse yeah. lovers for sure yeah i i can only imagine that it's difficult for you to choose your favorites for you know you only have 12 options for you know for the year calendar and you have so many beautiful yeah. Photographs. If you take a gallop around uh, Shelly's Instagram channel or any of her social media channels, for that fact, you can see all of her beautiful photos and the different different specialties that she's a part of. So I know, obviously, that you're an animal lover and a horse lover. Can you tell us a little bit about your furry friends? Yeah, I'd love to. So I'll start with the horses, of course. Um, I've got a 27-year-old quarter horse mare named Maggie Sue. And I have a 10 year old uh, solid paint bread mare named Fritzy. And she is like a really flashy bay with lots, four white socks and all of that. Uh, she's 13 this year. So I rode Maggie Sue Western, um, did some Western pleasure at local shows. And then Fritzy came along when we moved to our farm, our five acre farm four years ago. And I uh, didn't really know what she was good at, kind of bought her sight unseen, <laughs> Facebook, and uh, started taking lessons and decided she liked dressage. And I wanted to learn dressage too. And between really great lessons with a great instructor and just the process of teaching her something and kind of unteaching her some things. And I've become 10 times the rider that I was. So now when I get on Maggie Sue, she's like, what? You know, you actually know what you're doing now. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> but I don't really have time to show because the show season is my busy work season. And then the rest of the year, I mean, I don't have an indoor riding space. I don't have a heated barn and I live in the north. So I'm just really limited on how much I can ride in the winter. My new instructor, I think, would like to see me um, be able to show at some point. Maybe a schooling show or something would be fun. Just, um, you know, once we get Fritzy kind of moving in this new direction. But I just enjoy getting on and riding around my pasture, riding down the road, or, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I am also a person that likes to ride in the arena. I like to work on things. I like to have some goals and see progress. And, um, Fritzy was a very, very difficult horse. I did not count on that when I got her. And so the progress that I've made with her is uh, one of my favorite accomplishments of my life in the past four or five years. And especially being someone that's not like a horse trainer or anything like that. So that's fantastic. Oh, and then I have, oh yeah. go ahead. Yeah, tell us about your pooch. Oh, and I have, I have, yeah, I have, I have two miniature schnauzers. One, one's a special rescue charlie he has uh, his own facebook page because he had drama when we first got him but <laughs> and then we have a couple of barn cats and i have a husband who is should not have been the last thing mentioned um but he's terrific because he really helps um 
take care of horses when I go out of town and and he just supports me in everything that I do and uh, we don't have kids uh, by choice and we just have our fur babies that we love and and a farm to take care of which is a lot more work than we expected <laughs> and it was a lifelong dream of yours too to own a farm so that's yeah. like so yeah. exciting and here's the horse husbands that support the horsey dream yes. and all of our fur babies for sure um it's true yeah and i wanted to ask you really quick so i know when when uh, i sent over the interview questions i wanted to ask you if there were any interesting stories about your photography or horses but you said something uh when you were talking about fritzy that was really interesting so you bought her sight unseen on facebook like this is a really this is really interesting i'd like to hear more about that because uh, did you have i know sometimes with animals and their in their humans there's like this this gut feeling that this is the right one that they might have a lesson to teach us or just a feeling what was that how you decided to just jump in and, and purchase a horse set on scene on facebook would you tell us a little bit about that because that's not, that's kind of unusual <laughs> in the horse yeah world. i know and it's unusual for me like i'm a very like i'm a, a very like overthinker planner and I just, yeah, but when you were asking me that question, I had like goosebumps all up and down my neck and upper back, which I'm not even sure what that means either. Um, yeah, there was something about her because, you know, we have a Minnesota Horses Facebook page and there's just horses listed constantly. Um, and I just kept going back to her and I would ask her owner questions. She asked me questions because the horse had come back to her once or twice and she just didn't want it to go to just anyone. And mm -hmm. uh, saw some videos and some more photos and I was telling my husband and he's like, yeah, sure, whatever. You know, like we were in the stress of, you know, just moving here and it was about three hours away. So we just, hooked up the trailer and drove down there and I didn't even ride her. Wow. Like, I just, yeah, I had her vetted. <laughs> so I wasn't totally stupid. Well, and the owner had bred her like from like, she'd bred the mom, mm -hmm. sorry, from just, you know, so she had known this horse from birth and, and I could tell that it was like a horse that meant a lot to her, but that she just couldn't keep at the time. Ended up doing her senior photos here at a, uh, YouTube video about it. And it is my 100% most popular YouTube video that I've ever had. I haven't looked lately, but it's hundreds of thousands of views of the first time that she came back the next year after we bought her and um, saw Fritzy for the first time. And she was just here again a couple weeks ago and just, you know, just to see Fritzy. I kind of think of it like an open adoption, like, you know, she can come visit whenever she wants. And um, so I, I feel like it was a lot about the horse. Tritzy had a lot to teach me. Um, she is a, she is a strong mare. I am a strong mare. So we had to work that out. Um, I had to learn to trust her, which mm. is not something I've ever had to do. Um, mm -hmm. I had to take some, take some risks there and just trust that she wasn't going to kill me. Um, and now that I've kind of won her over, it's really, there's kind of a special bond that's formed there. And I'm not sure where that's going to take us in the years to come, but I don't have any intention of her ever going anywhere um, because she's been such a good teacher. She lets me know when I'm doing it wrong, which is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Well, not only did you get a lovely and beautiful horse, but you also made a friend out of her previous owner. So yeah, it's a pretty yeah. fantastic story. Well, and she more than pays for herself because um, she's super photogenic, puts her ears up for the camera. So I have so many pictures in my library that we, that like my stock photo library that, that her pictures in all these magazines to the point where we were able to like write off some of our horse expenses because my horses are, uh, make us enough money to be able to do that. Well, that is wonderful. Like, you know, yeah, that is, you've made it in life. Yeah, <laughs> you, have, you have famous horse models that grace the pages of horse publications. That couldn't yeah. be any cooler. Right. So switching gears a little bit, you and I just had a blast galloping around Arizona together. And, you know, we spent some time and you stayed with me in my house, my very first house guest at our horse property. Can you tell me a little bit about what brought you to Arizona from Minnesota and um, how, how, you know, how we ended up working together uh, here when you came to visit? Yeah. So uh, for about 
four years, I've been doing photo shoots for Farnham Horse. They make horse health products, uh, lots of fly control products. And they had a contest called the Super Mask Supermodel, where people could submit photos of their horse. And if they won the contest, they get all of this product. Um, fly, I think it was mostly fly control product, but they also got a full day photo shoot. And um, this year's winner got to have that photo shoot with me. And this year's winner happened to be in the Scottsdale area, which is just outside of Phoenix. Yes. And so you and I had been, um, we've been connecting on a business level, kind of a two person mastermind. And so immediately when I found out that I was going to get to do this shoot, I'm like, I know exactly who I'm going to task to assist me on this shoot because I knew we would work well together. Um, I work well with certain kinds of people and you're the kind of person I work well with. And so, yeah, so, um, so I, I asked you and you said yes. And so you came along scouting and there was a terrible storm that we like were freezing to death and we were <laughs> there was like a tornado in North Scott or in Northern uh, Phoenix. I mean, it was just this crazy day, the day before the shoot and then the day of the shoot was just perfect. It was. And, and when you say a full day, it was a full day. I think we were on our feet for, for 10 hours that day. It was like an eight hour photo shoot. And then, you know, we got there early and we spent some time wrapping up. So it was a long day. And the crazy weather, it's so weird. Every time I have a visitor to Arizona, Literally before Shelly got here, it was 115 degrees for like a week straight. And then she gets here and we meet up and it's storming and overcast and crazy weather and cold. Like this, this yeah. is the crazy part, cold. So <laughs> speaking of cold, can you tell people about these fabulous shirts we're wearing and how, how we came to be twin sisters wearing the beautiful blue <laughs> plaid shirts? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So after we were freezing ourselves to death at the scouting, because there was a cold, stormy wind go blowing through the barn where we were. We're in this metal barn in the middle of a lightning storm. I was like so afraid we were all going to get electrocuted. <laughs> but um, we, I said, well, let's go to the Tractor Supply. They'll have, um, you know, hoodies or something. Well, this is Arizona, so Tractor Supply doesn't have hoodies yet. And I walked up to Iraq and there were these, um, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a plaid shirt, but it's this really awesome, soft, stretchy fabric. And I picked one out while Carly, you had to go look for something else. I think I used and the then, ladies room. <laughs> oh, that was it. That was it. And so then, then you walked up and you were kind of looking here and there and you're like, Ooh, I really like these. And I'm like, like this. And I was, you know, I already had grabbed one and, and then the sizes that were left were kind of big, but I told her that they ran really small and, and she's like, well, I can't really get the same one. And I'm like, why not? And so we decided to just get matching shirts and be dorky. And we went out to eat afterwards with our matching shirts. And we showed up the shoot this mor the next morning in our matching shirts and nobody noticed. That Isn't was that probably the funniest part. That was the very funniest part. So if you're ever worried about what you look like, don't worry about it because most people are too concerned with whatever they're doing to even notice. So just go out there and rock your, <laughs> rock your crazy self however you are, right, Shelly? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was, it was a great story for life. And I will never wear this shirt without thinking of you. I feel exactly the same way. And it's a great travel shirt. So, you know, who knew? Mm -hmm. But this was like the only thing that either one of us liked at the tractor supply. So it was, yeah, it, it was really <laughs> that fun. That wasn't a t-shirt. I know, yeah. great, mem great memories. So in tractor supply. I wore it on the flight home. Actually, I wore it on my flight home and it was just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and well, here's the thing. I'm, I'm working with Shelly again, uh, traveling to California next month to work with her again as her photo photo assistant, which was so fun. And I learned so much and I met some really great people doing that. And it was such a gift. Um, but I'm bringing my shirt. So I hope you are. Awesome. Too. I'll bring my shirt too. Yes. Okay. <laughs> awesome. So, so go, moving on a little bit uh, to talk about your visit here to Arizona. I, you know, I had the privilege of having you take my photographs with my horse Sissy. And we were, we took photographs in the Phoenix Mountain Preserve, which is right across the street from my brand new house. Um, Shelly got to experience all the chaos that's going on around here with uh, some construction projects we have going on in the yard. So there's jackhammers and, you know, saws and men everywhere. And, you know, Sissy's been, you know, dealing with it really well. And, and Shelly, you, you were a gem while all this was going on. But, um, 
And Susie was a little stressed during our session. Um, you know, the, the preserve was new to her. There's a lot of commotion at the house. And she was a little less than well behaved, I guess I could say, being she was pulling out pulling out some mirror moves. So um, I just was wondering if you could share a few pointers on what horse owners should know going into a portrait session, particularly if their horse is not being their best selves. Um, this is a lesson I learned and it was a, a really great one. Yeah, and I was I called your photos today, so that's the step before editing. So Ooh. just know you're very close to being able to see proofs. And I think the number one thing I would want people to know is it's never as bad as you think it is. Like it can feel in the moment like your horse has not behaved for half a second in the last half hour. Um, but because photography is this, you know, one five hundredth of a second, just to pick a random number, there can be one five hundredth of a second where your horse looks like relaxed and calm and into you. And, the, and that photograph captures that. And, and eventually I think your feelings about how that shoot went will fade and you will be able to see that there were some soft moments um, because yeah, it was hard that we had a lot of circumstances that were less than favorable for her. And I think, you know, I think you, it would be good for you to share some of the lessons you learned too, but from a photographer standpoint, um, you know, just some of the things that we thought about later could have been done is maybe to familiarize her with the location before, mm -hmm. um, but we just didn't have time. And, and so it wasn't like we weren't trying to make it great. Uh, <laughs> and maybe to, we talked about possibly doing like a Farnham product, like Quietex, like something to just take the edge off, especially, you know, with the mare that's having feelings about everything. Um, and one of the things that I just generally do during a photo shoot when a horse is uptight that we weren't able to do as much because the footing was not comfortable for her either. It was this shale and she was very ouchy on her feet, but um, move, move, not making the horse stand too still for too long because they horses tend to build up energy when they have to stand still. And it's, um, it usually is going to result in some kind of a blow up at some point. And that was one of the things that I really learned from my trainer that I've brought into my photography is when a horse starts to build up that energy is to release it by just move their feet, move their feet, move their feet. But then there comes a point too, like we had a point where Sissy was moving her feet too much and she was just doing nervous circles. And so then we had to start backing her back into place just to get her to know that that she needed to plant her feet and, and listen to us for a little bit. But yeah, I literally have like, I don't know, 130 photos called, which is a lot. That's exciting. So, I can't. Yeah. So in the that. end, you know, it all works out. And, and I think I've, in my entire career, only had one session where I, we just called it because oh, wow. the horse was out of its mind. And mm. just for some reason, it was a gelding, you know. And then the next time I said, do this, this, and this to, you know, help your horse out. And the next session was great. So oh. you just never know. I mean, they're, they're live beings with feelings and not a lot of frontal lobe, you know, logic and, <laughs> and that kind of a thing. And so, and, you know, I think too, there were a couple of times where we all just like tried really hard to bring our energy down and just bring a calm feeling to the, to the park and the moment and all of that. And we saw her like really soften into those moments. And then someone would come over the hill on a mountain bike and it would end, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> or, we or want to exactly take, like control that yeah or want to take pictures of sissy when you're trying to take pictures of sissy you know or people will come yeah, by yeah. On there oh yeah with their dogs or or what have you yeah. we were in a you know a public place but you know, it was yeah. it was a very interesting experience for me because i i i have never ever had sissy behave so badly and i just it was um very eye-opening so like you said you know me to share a couple of moments Learn. It was a great lesson learning. I, I really believe I should have familiar, familiar, gotten her familiar. Familiarized. Thank yes. you. <laughs> My tongue didn't want to say that one. Gotten her familiar with the, the mountain preserve first. I think that would have really helped. Um, but what what is a tip that I really learned is even if your horse is being naughty, just watch your facial expressions because like you said, mm -hmm. they, this beautiful soft moment can be captured in you know a millisecond so it, you know so calm your energy and smile and just you know just be graceful with the whole process because you you do the magic behind behind the camera 
So as long as you're not scowling and, you know, being angry or, you know, frowning, you know, and you keep a pleasant you know, look on your face, there, there can be that beautiful moment that's captured, which is evident in the, in the few pictures you've already shared with me, um, where you really did capture the softness and the bond that we do have, even though she was being a bit naughty. <laughs> yeah, so, a bit naughty. A bit but naughty. I think that was, like, that's why I have so many keeper images, was you were, um, you kept a smile on your face and it wasn't fake. Like, even when she was being crazy, you were, you laughed it off. Like, I, I saw a couple of pictures where she was like, you know, her head's like out of the frame. She just is flipping out and you're just laughing, you know, like, if you let yourself get really mad about that, even when you were smiling, it wouldn't be your eyes. It would just be your mouth, you mm -hmm. know, and you, you had a, like, you managed to keep a really genuine, happy face through 90% of the photos and I would just be like oh no no but her face <laughs> but Carly's face is good um Sissy's maybe not so good but man yeah, Carl, I didn't even have to worry about your face like mm -hmm. I just had to worry about finding the one where Sissy was like looking the most calm and and cooperative yeah <laughs> it's just so it was so funny I, my sister actually taught me that my sister is a little bit of a, a budding photographer herself and she took some early pictures of of me and and she said it to me she said mind your face, you know, be, be mm -hmm. pleasant. But the, the other reason why it was easy for me to smile and laugh it off is because A, I know that's really not her personality, but then B, I was just letting gratitude flow through me because I was working with like the renowned Shelly Paulson and I was so excited <laughs> to have it happen. And I was coming off my own horse property and going across to a mountain preserve where I get to ride her, you know, in the future and hopefully she'll be more calm. But like just so much like happiness was pouring out of me at the time that it was just it was pretty easy to to have that authentic smile because and I had you as a house guest so it was just such a special time <laughs> I was it excited was. Was great time. yeah so not yeah. only is Shelly a you know famous horse photographer but <laughs> she has written two books so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the books that you have out there and then we can go into some questions about your author life sure um I'll tell the whole story of the of the this book how it came how it went from an e email in my inbox to an actual book with my photos in it so oh, I can't um, wait to hear this <laughs> it was my birthday April 20th um uh let's see must have been like three three years ago probably yeah because it took about a year um and I get an email in my inbox from someone at Amherst Media. And as a photographer, I know this name. I know this publisher name. I have books by Amherst Media on my own shelf. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I remember where I was. I was sitting in a coffee shop. I had a friend visiting. She was getting her coffee. She came and sat down. I'm like, you would not believe the email I just got. And um, I, so I was so excited. I replied, when I was at my computer and could write big words, uh, I wrote back right away and I said, yes, I'd love to talk to you about this. And my biggest hesitation was I didn't want to write a how-to book. I feel like um, the knowledge I have should probably cost more than $24.95 um, that I would get a very small percentage of. And so, um, but he said, no, actually, we're, we're looking at a different format. That's more of a picture book with captions, which was a little less daunting to think about writing too. Because I am a writer, but I'm, I, haven't, I don't have a ton of experience or education in writing. But I will say I am a writer because I have a book. And uh, so over the next like six months, we worked on picking photos and I had to write captions, which was hard because a lot of the photos aren't of people. So there's like no story. So then I was like finding fun facts and, you know, like foals legs are almost full length when they're born and, you know, like interesting things to do like that. And the next April was the eighth, I think it was like the 13th or 18th was when it really was released. So it was a full year process. Um, and it like the, the guy that originally talked to me said, you won't make a lot of money off of this, but it's a hell of a calling card. And that's been the case. I mean, the first check I got from them was, you know, it was less than a thousand, but it was more than 500, you know? And, uh, and I make a little more money when I sell them myself. I buy them in bulk and then sell them myself. But, you know, for the most part, it was like I didn't have to put any money into it. And somebody else did all the work. Uh, I got to have 
fairly good creative input. We had a few battles over the cover because they had a different image here that was literally from my first year as a photographer because mm -hmm. they just started at the top of my list, which was my oldest pictures. I'm like, no, not that one. <laughs> um, and then a few, I used to be a graphic designer, so a few type things we had to have discussions about too. But in the end, I feel just really proud of the book. And, um, you know, someday I, I would love to possibly have a, um, you know, a real coffee table book with a hard cover and all that of my work. Um, but this was a great start. It's a very legitimizing experience as a photographer to have somebody publish a book of your work. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the story of Courses, Portraits and Stories. Published well, I wanna, I wanna pause there for just a second because it just won the, um, Best equine related nonfiction book at the Equine Media Awards at the American Horse right. Publications Conference in New Mexico this year. So, you found out it was a mm -hmm. finalist and you were excited about that. So, tell us how did you feel when, when your book won this really prestigious award? That must have been like an amazing moment for you. It was a huge shock. Like, for me, not, being, not having writing be my main thing. I was like, well, I'm going to submit my book, I to make my publisher happy and all of that. And then when I won, I, was, I mean, if you had a camera on my face, it would have been like, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a shock and an honor because, you know, I really, I really consider the American Horse Publications a very prestigious um, organization. Their, their awards are very prestigious. And so I was really, really honored to uh, win an award. Well, that's fantastic. Congratulations. I, I, that is a, a, a huge honor. So good, good on you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, I wanted to hear about your newest book. You've, you've just uh, put out a new ebook, The Quick Start Guide to Equestrian Photography. Tell us a little bit yeah. about that and, and how people can find it and, and use it and what cool stuff is in there for them to know about. Yes, yeah, so this is an electronic publish, so I don't even have a print version. Um, I was, I partnered up with Nicole Begley at Hair of the Dog. Uh, she, she's a, mostly a dog photographer, but also an equestrian herself and does some equestrian photography, but she is the bomb when it comes to online education. Mm. And she had contacted me and was like, I had put something out there about maybe doing some eBooks last winter and she contacted me and she's like, let me help you and let me help you get the word out. And this is a topic that I could really market to my people because a lot of dog photographers kind of want to switch over or add equine photography. And so um, she was a great mentor. Um, I had done an ebook years ago called the lazy photographer's guide to workflow, which I'm going to rewrite and re-release sometime this winter. But um, you know, just having her as a partner really elevated um, my work and, you know, just she was able to get it out to a huge audience that I don't have access to because she has a big mailing list. And so that I just got actually got September payment and I was really surprised because every month I just she and by the way, as a partner, she also takes care of all the payments, all the sales, all the hosting, like all I had to do was create it and then hand it over. Fantastic. Which was, yeah, it was amazing. And then we share the profits on all the people she brings in um, as far as sales. And so I just have this nice little trickle amount of money coming in every month from that book. And I actually just emailed her today and was like, let's do more. Because <laughs> uh, we had talked about doing an online course and my schedule just does not lend itself to that at this point. I'm pretty maxed out and online courses are a lot of work. Mm -hmm. So we're going to probably do a couple more ebooks together. But this one is called The Quick Start Guide to Equestrian Photography, and it's geared towards people who are maybe already photographers but haven't done a lot of equine work, or people who are doing equine work and just want to learn how to do it better. And some of the key things are like what equipment I use, what settings I use, um, and then a huge part of it is posing, posing people with horses. Like I said to you during our session, you know, there's really – not that many ways to post people with horses. Like, I think I broke it down to about, you know, I don't know, six different like setups and then variations within those setups. And so that's all in the ebook. And when you order the ebook, you get a posing guide app for your phone. So then you could just like bring it up on your phone secretly there, you know, when they're changing clothes or something in the session and, and get some different posing ideas. 
I, I really like to help people um, become their best selves and do great work. And, you know, I can't take everyone's photos in the entire world who has horses. And so <laughs> to empower people to do that better is, uh, you know, one of the things that I really value. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's a really low overhead to, to do, um, you know, eBooks. And that's partly why I love them so much is that there's just, I can create them pretty quickly. I'm a designer, so I can design them and make them look really pretty. So. Well, everybody's pretty much, you know, consuming on, on their technology anyway. So it's probably the best format for someone that, you know, that's looking to, uh, get some quick tips and some pose guides and they can take it with them, right? So they can take it on the road wherever they go without having to stuff a book in their suitcase. So that's fantastic. I wanted to circle back really quickly to, yeah, exactly. uh, to your courses, portraits and stories. I know that that was uh, published traditionally as you had mentioned. And I, I just was wondering, so we have a lot of people, I think that will be joining the podcast that are interested in, in both sides of the business, um, self, independent publishing and then also traditional publishing. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously they came to you, it was like this magical gift on your birthday and they were interested because you had created a reputation for yourself as the go-to horse photographer in our industry. Um, so I'm wondering, what do you think have been the pros and the cons of working with a traditional publisher and would you do it again or would you consider maybe independently publishing the next time around? I know you did mention that the, the royalties are, are fairly small, but still nothing to sneeze at. It's another arm of income, right? So any way it comes in is a good mm -hmm. thing for a, a female entrepreneur. <laughs> so just a little yeah. bit about, you know, your experience and pros and cons and, and any advice you might be able to offer to someone who is being approached by a traditional publisher, I think would be wonderful. Yeah, I listened to, um, I listened to a couple podcasts. One of them is, uh, interviews a lot of women and a lot of them have written books. And one of the things that I hear them talk about a lot that, that was a struggle for me with traditional publishing is not having the la the final say on some things. So, <laughs> you know, like, yeah, like, oh, I would have done this differently. Okay, well, that's okay. And I think Amherst gave me more freedom than some the thing you give up with traditional publishing besides, you know, your commission per book is the creative control. Mm -hmm. uh, you have an editor that like, you know, we went back and forth on uh, I have a, the last chapter is silhouettes, which is a, obvious and this is one of my favorite photos it's it was taken from a drone oh wow and to, yeah I don't know if you can see it very well but I can it's like, it's beautiful it's like uh four yeah. horses and their humans standing together in a field and you can see the shadows of them standing with their animals is that right right awesome. and so we had a debate whether or not that was a silhouette ah. because you think of silhouettes as like shooting up into the sky not shadows on the ground and in the end i won the debate but you know <laughs> one whatever i mean i don't think it was like a big deal but it's that kind of stuff where it was it was just you know in the end they could do whatever they wanted because mm -hmm. i signed a contract to that um they have a greater reach you know a publisher has uh, the ability to market your book to a wider audience i don't know that that really helped me that much because i would guess most of the people who bought the book are people who know me mm. or know of me you mm -hmm. know what i mean like so i think it depends too just on how much they're marketing your book um yeah and then the ebook i mean i've made 20 times more on the ebook so there's just there's just a lot more profit potential there because in in the end really with an ebook I don't even have the cost of printing mm -hmm. so I just every all the money besides the you know credit card fees and and the you know profit sharing with Nicole was just mine mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I really like that and so you know they each have their place like I said the book kind of legitimizes you um, when it goes through a traditional publisher, but I also think it's really hard to get published. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom's an author and she, she shopped her book around so many times to small publishers and she ended up just submitting it to Houghton Mifflin who took it and published it and published two more after that. And, and she won all these awards and everything, but she was almost ready to give up because, you know, it's really hard to find a publisher that can 
you know, see the value in your work and, and take a chance on you. And that's not actually that, that uncommon of a story. I think the same thing happened to J, um, JK Rollins with the Harry Potter books. Yeah. She, she got denied, you know, 50, you know, hundreds of times from other publishers. And then finally someone took a chance and look at her now. So yeah. never stop putting your, your mm -hmm. creative dream out there. Anything is possible. And, and when people tell you no, that just means they're not the right space for you to walk into. You just shift gears yeah. and you, you look for your yes. I think yeah. that uh, that's, that's really powerful. And thank you for sharing that about your mom. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. And then the cool thing with the ebook is, you know, you found a really powerful partner put a strong email list that you, that you partnered up and worked with and did, then did all the marketing yourself and look at the revenue you're creating. You're creating more revenue than you did through the traditional publisher because they do marketing and they do have a bigger distribution arm, but you do a lot of marketing on your own for your book too. So you, you know, you're, you're, you didn't just hand it over and be like, go, you do a lot of work on your own too to, to lift up your book and, and make sure it gets into the right hands. So, so yeah. And they, they had expectations of me as well. Like they wanted, you know, and I, I would constantly like if I had a book signing or I was doing an event or anything, I would let them know because if they did ever want to publish another book with me, I mean, I want to be, the, I want to be a good um, author, like somebody that they feel like was worth their effort. Mm -hmm. um, but they were like, you know, we'd like your rank on Amazon to be this. And we'd like you to be, you know, show us what you're doing to market your book. And so it wasn't just like, oh, here's the book and go do it. Like there, there was some responsibility there too. And I feel like I could have done more if it was my primary job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I did what I could. And I felt like, you know, like they, if you go to my blog and type in book signing or something like I had a really neat party and I had a bunch of people come and I had cupcakes and wine and everything was equine themed and oh, it was fun. at a local barn that yeah so I just I had a lot of fun with the book and you know so the ebook didn't come with all that fanfare right mm -hmm. and so the the traditional book and having you know stacks of these and line out the door of people wanting me to sign them to them I mean that experience is just but you get that too because you have a print book you know i mean your novel mm -hmm. is afforded you that that same author experience mm -hmm. where maybe you don't have that if you only do e-publishing mm -hmm. well thank you for sharing all of that and and congratulations on the success of both your books and and the additional mm -hmm. revenue streams for your already successful photography business i mean nothing wrong with that that's fantastic no not at all <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, your you know so your question your equestrian work has been published worldwide and can be seen in you know all these fantastic you know equestrian magazines the ones that I grew up as a little girl reading and loving and, and you're in them and and you also um, do marketing collateral for major horse brands all of which I also grew up with as a little cowgirl using which is so fantastic uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you began building relationships with these these fantastic brands like Farnham and Neutrina and Smart Pack and you know how, how did you reach out to them and begin these relationships and then also a little bit about how you how you maintain those relationships too yeah well you and i have read a book called so good they can't ignore you by cal newport that highly was, recommend <laughs> cal newport we'll, we'll talk about cal newport in a little bit i'm sure yes um not a single one of those relationships started because i sent an email or made a phone call they all started because i have put heart and soul and 100% effort into creating the best photos I can. Um, being technically strong, being, being um, professional, hardworking, all of that kind of stuff, and just having a great portfolio online. Every single one of those connections um, came from that, from, from people reaching out to me um, and, then, and then taking it from there. And that's great. It's great to be in a position where where they find you and they want to hire you versus having to go out and self promote a lot and self promotion isn't my favorite thing. And so, um, that's, that's really my, 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 when people ask, how do you get published? I'm like, go create a body of work. That's exceptional. That's different from what everyone else is doing. Um, that's technically strong. You know, people, if all your photos are of girls in prom dresses on horses, you're probably not going to get, 
published. You're probably not going to get brands interested in working with you. And that's okay. Maybe you're the best photographer of girls in, in prom dresses. But um, I think people don't realize that in order to work with, uh, especially with, with the brands and the commercial shoots, it's a whole different ball game. I mean, there's, I've been on five day shoots with 30 crew members. Um, we, we talked a little bit about how you establish the relationships with these fabulous companies that you've been working with uh, in, in doing photograph shoots for them. So once you have these wonderful partners, how, what do, you, do you do anything to maintain those relationships? How do you, how do you continue, continue that relationship after you've made the initial connection? Well, I try not to be a pest, um, you know, but I try and be available and responsive. I think one of the top things is just when someone emails you, you reply and you reply efficiently and with you know a lot of positivity i'm i'm big on positivity i i do my very best to try and just always use positive wording even if i don't agree with something or i'm not able to help someone um i think it's really important in in business to business relationships to be a good problem solver um instead of saying nope that doesn't work it's like okay well i'm not sure that's going to work but let me figure out a way to make that work and that's um, what's really going to give you an edge um, moving forward. You know, I hear a lot of stories of bad experiences with photographers and a lot of it's like bad communication, um, improper expectations, unprofessional behavior. You know, it's just some of it's just really basic. I don't know if people just haven't, you know, been out in the working world ever. I mean, I had jobs in corporate America before, you know, when I was in that big things but you know I've worked in corporate settings and so there's just ways to behave and there's ways to take care of people and treat people that um, keeps them keeps you front of mind and then every one of my clients gets a calendar for Christmas so that's one way like every month they turn the calendar and there's another Shelly Paulson photo so um, I have a mailing list for my stock photo library but not for just my general photography because at this point I just do so many different things it would be really hard to send one big newsletter out. I'm sure I'm probably missing the boat on that because newsletters are such a big thing right now. But whenever I update my stock photo library, which is what the, uh, a lot of the editors use and some of the brands, um, I will let them know like what kind of content's been added. So that's another way to keep that, you know, fresh in people's minds is to, to do that about quarterly. But I try not to be like, hey, do you have any work for me? Do you have any work for me? Like, I don't want to be a pest. Well, and clearly you're not a pest because can you tell us a little the name of that book and the author again, and I'm going to hold it up so people yeah, can yeah, yeah. see the cover uh, because clearly yeah. you are being so, so good. good. They can't ignore you. Yes. And it's um, if you look at the subtitle, why skills trump passion in the quest for work you love. And it's a fantastic book about why you need to be exceptional basically in order to succeed in, in your work. And that's a mistake I see a ton of p photographers make is they're just really happy with the status quo and following trends and being like the, you know, the, the top photographers and they don't do anything to make themselves stand out and they don't work on, you know, another one of Cal Newport's books, deep work. They don't do deep work. They don't, um, you know, really hone their skills. Deep work. There it is. Here's the book. Rules for, Deep work. Yeah. Rules for success in a distracted world by Cal Newport. These are the books that brought Shelly and I together. Actually, these. Yeah. Highly yeah. recommend all these books. So good they can't ignore you, and Deep Work yep. by Cal Cal Newport. Uh, yeah. And and so I just learned so much from you right there. It's like and and I've sat in on your um your seminars at the American Horse Publications Conference annually, and you and you. What I really love about you is, yes, you're optimistic. And I heard you say communication is so important and also being professional. Like those are very important things. But what I really like about you, not only are you optimistic and positive, but you're constantly evolving and working on your craft and, uh, you know, adding like this artistic um, piece to what you're doing. You're not just taking portraits. You're, you're you're making art. And I think that that's what really mm -hmm. sets you apart from some, some others that may be uh, in the same field. You just, uh, you really are, are thinking about things and, and creating really beautiful images and art that tell a story just by looking at the picture. And, that, and that's why I love your, your photography so much. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I put a lot of energy into self-improvement, mm -hmm. you know, and just 
like what new thing can I learn? Like I get bored if I'm doing the same thing over and over. I can't, I could never work in a factory, you know? And so <laughs> I don't want my photography to become a factory where it's like this pose, this pose and this pose, you know, just switch out the girl and the horse. Mm -hmm. you know, you're a great, great example of that. You know, it's very oh, clear you. that you're, you're constantly evolving. So since we started talking about Cal Newport I, and, and how he, his books brought us together, you know, we're both avid readers and, and we, we both enjoy self-improvement. And so we got to talking at last year's or this year's, I'm sorry, American Horse Publications Conference. And you recommended one of his books to me. And uh, you, you've also written this really eye-opening blog post about your experience reading this book, which is called Digital Minimalism. Mm -hmm. on living better with less technology, which is really fantastic. Yeah. And I will link to your blog post in the show notes so people Great. can go and read that fantastic blog. But I was wondering if you would share a little bit about um, how you re-examined your relationship with technology, primarily your, your phone usage and your social media usage. And uh, what, like, talk to us about what your experience was actually going through a 30 day digital detox and, and why was that so life changing for you? I think people would be really interested to hear about that. I know I was. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's very countercultural. Um, yeah. It was, I think, uh, late February, I read the book Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport just because I was feeling like my relationship with my phone wasn't super healthy. I was getting a screen time report from my phone every Sunday and it was telling me I was spending you know, ungodly amounts of time on that phone. And I just felt like something wasn't right in my life, like I wasn't living it. And um, so I read the book and, and the book challenged the reader to take 30 days off of social media. And I was like, oh, come on, it's March. What do I have going on? Not that much, I can do this. And um, so I did it. And about a week into it, my husband I sat across from my husband on the couch I'll never forget this moment he said it's nice to finally have you living here with me again oh, and I was wow. like oh my gosh I've been I've been checked out I've been absent every spare moment I was you know scrolling my phone and 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 looking at social media on my computer and not engaging with him not being out with my horses not spending time with friends not you know, just living my real life. And um, the 30 days was up and I was in no hurry to get back. I, I thought I would keep up with my business accounts. I posted like three times, but it was a perfect month because I had no content. Like I wasn't shooting. So it wasn't like I, you know, was missing out on sneak peeks for people or whatever, you know, and came to the end of the 30 days, like, okay, how do I live my life now? And I set some pretty good boundaries, which, you know, have gotten a little mushy in the months since, but I still can go a full two days on one charge on my phone. And to me, that's like a sign that I'm using it appropriate. Because really, I closed my personal Instagram account, I don't post to my personal Facebook page very often. I mainly am using social media for what it needs to be used for in my life. And that is um, business promotion. Mm -hmm. I do post personal things in my Instagram stories, but that's also with a business intent, to be honest. Uh, I listen to a commercial photography podcast and they talk about the importance of Instagram for art buyers and art directors to, to hire you and how you need to be showing your personal life in your stories. And so, um, so I'm very intentional about all these things that I'm doing. I just have some days where I still catch myself scrolling. But I also, in Instagram, you can have it tell you, you can set an amount of time each day. And it doesn't shut down after that many minutes, but like I have mine set to 40. Like after 40 minutes, um, it gives me a little notification and I'm like, okay, I need to put it away <laughs> for the rest of the day. But I also do things like, um, I try and shut my computer down at 6.30, you know, six or 6.30 and stay off it until the morning. I don't, um, look at my phone until after I've had breakfast, you know, so I've just, it, it, it kind of gave me a little bit of a cold turkey to reset and then allow me to kind of build back up. And one of the big things is no Facebook on my phone, like no personal Facebook. Um, I'd love to have no Instagram on my phone, but um, there, you can't do stories really um, in a, any meaningful way from anywhere else. And so I'm actually thinking about doing a, uh, the Mac OS, the new Mac OS now is going to let me say, I only want to spend 
20 minutes on Instagram each day and it'll lock me out. So a little, I'd like a little external self-control with, with Instagram because being a visual person, that's probably my, you know, it's my favorite social network for sure. Yeah. And, and in talking to you, a couple of the things that um, I think you were really a takeaway for you from doing the digital detox was, was one, you were more present or more in the now mm-hmm. with your horses and your, even your editing and your husband and, you know, just being here right now during the day. But then also, you know, this kind of trickles back a little bit to Cal Newport's book, book Deep Work. What you, yeah. what, what you really got out of the, you know, kind of slimming down on how often you were using social media for personal needs or just scrolling to entertain yourself, you took that time and actually were able to generate more productive products for your business and, and for your life, right? So you took that time, you were kind of just scrolling mindless entertainment, maybe bored, and you were able to transfer that into, you know, creating things that, that elevate the work that you are doing, right? Is that right? Absolutely. I mean, the, the ebook, the, 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 quick start guide. I wrote it in two days. I designed it in two days because when I was writing and when I was designing, everything was off email. Mm-hmm. Um, my phone was on silent. Um, you know, he talks about, uh, if you are working on one thing and you get a notification and you go to that thing, it takes you at least 20 minutes to get back to the focus you had when you left. And you imagine how we typically work with our email open and our phone sitting there with messaging open and notifications on, Um, you know, it's like when I want to get work done, it all goes off. I go into like, you know, silent mode, just to work your work in a really focused way mode. And then I'm done so much faster. Mm -hmm. And then I have time to do the dishes before I go to bed and, you know, or sit on the couch with my dogs or ride my horse. I mean, I rode so much more this summer than I've ever ridden ever. And it was because, well, it's five o'clock, it's six o'clock. I'm I'm out of here. I'm going to go to, go to the barn, go out my, you know, 30 feet to the barn and go ride my horses. And that's just been really, it's been really great and really healthy. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I can't thank you enough for introducing me to Cal Newport and his books because it's changed the way I work in my life. And, and I found, you know, when you're not paying attention, you don't realize how much time you actually are spending, not really doing anything, just scrolling through and, in you know, yeah not doing a whole lot on social media. Uh, so I've found that I'm getting so much more work done and I have more time for my family. I have more time for my animals. I have more time to be up to what I want to be up to in the world and not just yeah. spinning my wheels out there in cyberspace. So, so thank you so much for recommending those books. I will also link to those books in the show notes so you can go check them out yeah. on Amazon and see if they're for you and maybe change the way you work. So, um, you know, I wanted to move a little bit into, uh, you know, writing and, and, photography and maybe some tips for people that they can they can take away from this interview although they've gotten a plethora from you so far I mean this has been such an informational interview thank you again for your time Um, but I wanted to ask you know what what have you found to be the hardest part about being an equine photographer and then on the flip side like what do you what do you find is the best part you've already talked a little bit about you know capturing those moments and creating art but you know like very specifically you know what's been the hardest part for you and then what's your favorite I think the hardest part is just not having a predictable income Mm. you know it's and just it takes a lot of faith I think to be self-employed to be a solo entrepreneur um And it's just, and my husband's a freelancer too. So we don't have any like, well, we know this month we're going to have this amount of money. And so that's been a, that's always a challenge is just hoping that it will work out. And then when I do get big sums that we are uh, careful about that, not to spend it all (laughs) once and, you know, meter that out into the following months. And, and so it's the, somebody, a financial planner once described our income as lumpy. (laughs) So you know, we'll like get big things of money and then we'll go without any income and then big things of income. So that's probably the biggest challenge is the financial challenge. Um, I have to say that really one of my favorite things about, you know, that's kind of the trade off of that is the flexibility in my schedule is, and both of us being freelancers, I mean, we can sit and have coffee and talk about life until 930 in the morning if we want to. Um, usually that means I got to work a little bit later um, or something like that. But just like 
we have a pretty great life and we make enough money to have our own farm and to have horses and we're not rich by any means, but we're comfortable and well, comfortable as you can be when you don't have predictable income. But, you know, I just, I feel like it, it's, I have really fulfilling work that allows me to live the life that I want. And um, I know that, you know, we're getting older and there'll come a point where we just don't have, you know, the ability to, to keep a farm and all of that. And so I'm really glad we're doing it at this point in our lives um, while we're able-bodied enough to, to manage the land and the animals and all of that. So that's really fantastic. It's like you've basically invented your life. You've invented a life that works for you around what you love and what your husband loves, but also, you know, that gives you the flexibility to actually enjoy your life without being a slave to yeah. a cubicle. And uh, uh -huh. I really, that's what this podcast is about. So thank you for sharing those insights. I think those would be really valuable for people to hear. Uh, secondly, is there one thing that you wish that you had known when you started out, like if you had a do over, what would you go, go back and tell your starting out entrepreneur self, do this? Uh, you know, I'm going to talk about a photography piece with that because it I, took me a couple of years to figure this out. And this made the number one difference in my work. And that is light first location. Second. We get really entranced by locations and try and make, make things work. But if the light is bad, the light is bad. And if the light is good and you can find a good location in that light, that is when the angels sing and, you know, everything comes alive. And so when I just, I remember just having kind of an epiphany, like, what if I just, what if I found good light first instead of picking a good location first and then trying to make it work. And that made all the difference. If every photographer just did that, I'm sure we would see a lot better work from most people. <laughs> That's amazing. And the, and the light in your photography is just beautiful and rich Thank and you. glowing and, and gorgeous. You know, in your per personal, I mean, there's a lot of options for marketing out there, but in your personal opinion, what, what would you say is the most valuable tool for people to, to market uh, their products or their businesses? Well, I honestly, I think that um, as much as social media is fun and free and popular, I think most creatives, uh, especially photographers, underestimate the power of a great website. Most of my clients, um, probably more my non-portrait clients, come to my website first to pre-qualify me. And so not only should the information be correct, but it should be updated fairly often. In fact, it's very high on my list right now to do a blog post because <laughs> I haven't because I get busy and uh, it's easier and more fun to post on social media. But my website needs to be maintained in order for me to continue to grow my business. That's great advice because I know that there's been speculation that the website is dead and all that. But, I, you know, I, I believe that it should be the very first thing that comes up when people search for a name or, or for business is, is someone's uh, website and something that's easy to use also, right? So there's a, there's, yeah. it's important too, people are doing searches on phones more often. So it needs to be mobile optimized as well as current. And mm -hmm. I think current is, is really important too. So thanks for sharing that. So one of the questions I wanted to ask you is what are you curious about? But what's really interesting to me is you've mentioned podcasts so many times throughout throughout this uh, conversation and clearly you're a fan of podcasts. I, I think you know, podcasts are growing and it's a great way to get information as you're, you know, commuting or cleaning stalls or cleaning the house. And it's a great way, you know, I'd use them when I'm at the gym, you know, when I'm on the treadmill, I listen to podcasts. So I'm learning while I'm taking care of my body. I was wondering if you would recommend some of your favorite podcasts that you think would be informational for fans of photography or, you know, also other entrepreneurs, like what are your favorite podcasts? Yeah, I'd say probably most of my favorites don't have anything to do with photography. Um, my number one favorite, every time a new episode's out, I listen to it, is How I Built This by Guy Raz. And it's just all these amazing um, uh, founders of companies and the stories of how they built their business. And, you know, some became billionaires and some and ended up empty handed. And, you know, it's just, it's fascinating to me to hear the stories of, of entrepreneurs and how how they built their businesses. And I, I learn a lot. And I, I just, I love, I mean, Guy Raz is such a great interviewer and he just, he asks the right questions and he, I just, I love the whole production of it too. Um, 
uh, on a photography side, the one that I've mentioned a couple times of um, that's kind of commercial photography related is one called um, Dear Art Producer. And where the, the woman, she's a photographer's agent and she interviews art producers at companies and agencies and like, what are you looking for? How do you find photographers? What do you want them to, to, to do on set? You know, like there's just, uh, it's just like been a wealth of information in an area that I need more, to know more about. Um, the Northrop's, Tony and Chelsea Northrop have a great photography podcast. They talk about a little bit of everything. They're a married couple. They're funny. Um, from on a marketing side, I love the Story Brand podcast with Donald Miller. Um, I was a huge Donald Miller fan before he was a big deal. Like I story branded my entire website and uh, I just, I love that marketing, story based marketing. And uh, I mean, the list could go on. I'm kind of blanking on, on the rest yeah. of them, but those are ones that I'm really big on, especially how I built this. It's just like, I want to hug it. I'm so excited. Thank you for sharing those because, you know, information I think is gold and, you know, your recommendations are so helpful. I will make sure to link to those podcasts in the show notes so people can go and check those out too. Thank you for the recommendations. Well, I just, I wanted to say thank you so much for spending time with me and giving me the gift of your time and being one of my very first podcast interviews on the Equestrian Author Spotlight. It's been such a joy to have you and boy, what a wealth of information. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your uh, time and and information. And I was hoping you'd share a little bit about where people can find out more about you and your work. All right. Well, I'm super honored to be number one. I was your first guest in your new house and your first <laughs> guest on your podcast. I mean, it's like, I just, I can't even get over it. It's just been so great. And I just, I love our friendship that's blossoming and it's just um, full of blessings. Um, you know, the best place to start would be my website, ShellyPaulson.com. Shelly is with an E-Y and Paulson is with an O-N. And uh, from there, you can get to all my social media. I mean, on Facebook, it's at Shelly Paulson Photography. On Instagram, at Shelly Paulson Photography. I have Twitter. I don't use it. Um, YouTube slash Shelly Paulson. But again, all that's linked on my contact page to on my website. Fantastic. And your books are available where? Yes, on my website. Okay, fantastic. And on Amazon. And if you want a signed copy, you want to order it through my website. I will, uh, last year I did a, like a combo, like book plus calendar sale. So I will be um, offering that again. So if you want to get someone else something, get yourself a little something, you know, I'll be uh, doing a combo sale starting probably um, early November. Fantastic. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us. Uh, me and Shelly Paulson, what a fantastic uh, twin interview. You know, this is a friendship mm -hmm. made in heaven. And thank you for sharing your insights with us again, Shelly. And have a great rest of your day. We'll talk again soon. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shelly. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us this week on the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. I hope you enjoy these Q&A sessions with wonderful equine authors who love all things horses and writing, just like me. Visit my website, carlycadecreative.com, where you can read the show notes, and make sure you never miss a show by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you so much for your support. Want a free guide to secrets of horse book authors? Gallop over to carlycadecreative.com forward slash wisdom to have author advice delivered instantly to your inbox. If you are an author who writes about horses and would like to be spotlighted, please let me know. Visit my contact page at carlycadecreative.com to fill out a request. I'd be happy to have you on the show too. Thank you for tuning in to the Equestrian Author Spotlight Podcast. See you next time. I'm your host, Carly Cade. Creative writing makes my spurs jingle.